At the outset, I'd like to uh, thank Enzo Viscusi, our board member, for underwriting this meeting. Uh, Enzo, I like to say, runs the best postgraduate uh, seminar on Italy. Uh, and uh, as he is wont to do, he is modestly sitting at the very rear of the room. Enzo, stand up. Let's give you a round of applause. I am delighted to welcome back uh, to the Foreign Policy Association Prime Minister Giuliano Amato. Mr. Amato needs no introduction uh, to this audience. He's appeared in this forum uh, on any number of occasions. Uh, most recently, he addressed the FPA in his capacity as Vice President of the Convention on the Future of Europe. In addition to serving not once but twice as Prime Minister of Italy, Mr. Amato has held numerous cabinet posts, including Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of the Interior, Minister of the Treasury, and Head of the Italian Antitrust Authority. Mr. Amato is a prolific author uh, on European matters, federalism, and comparative government. He has chosen as the topic for his talk this evening, Russia Today from a European Perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm welcome to one of the extraordinary public figures of our time, Giuliano Amato. So, well, very nice of you and very nice of all of you to be here. Uh, let me say that the, this topic was chosen together somehow. Uh, but I uh, find it extremely interesting because there is something uh, bizarre about our relationship with Russia. Because on the one side we cooperate intensely with the Russians, on the other side we are forced somehow to be confrontational with them. At the same time they are aware that they share with us several vital interests but, as several authors have written, they tend to be paranoid with us, and mostly with the Americans, more than with the Europeans. And here I come to my basic point that the European perspective is not at all different from the US one, even though, of course, we are in a different situation for the simple reason that we are neighbors neighbors, uh, the European Union is now at the border of Russia and, uh, and vice versa. Uh, so this makes our case slightly different, but substantially the difference is not relevant at all. Let me begin with my first point, the sort of schizophrenic attitude that we have had up to now with cooperation on the one side and confrontation on the other. Cooperation between the European Union and, and Russia is even more than cooperation, I would say. If you think that uh, in cumulative terms 80% of the foreign investments in Russia come from the European Union, we could speak of economies that are even more intertwined than linked. Second, the energy issue and therefore <coughs> the natural gas that we are uh, more and more buying from them. Of course, this tends to be presented, the second item, as a dependence of the European Union of Russia. It is not so. They cannot eat their natural gas, and they are well aware of it. And therefore, uh, natural gas creates a condition of interdependence between us. 
which of course leads the two parties to find agreements, to find solutions whenever uh, any kind of issue might arise. But, uh, let's say, our uh, areas of common activities go beyond uh, these two uh, clear-cut examples, uh, economic investments, natural gas. The European Union, as you know, has several programs that are uh, uh, reserved, basically, to its own member states research and innovation, research and development. We are now working on our seventh program of research uh, and development. And if you look at the countries and at the centers of research taking part in the program, which means in specific projects, uh, proposed to the program and accepted by the Commission and therefore supported financially um, on, on, on the European budget, you might also think that Russia is a member state of the, of the Union in the sense that you find the Russian institutions the same way as you find Italian, French, Belgian, German, etc. So there is a, a very close interrelationship also in this area. In uh, the, we uh, uh, call our common European activities uh, in the area of uh, anti-terrorism, uh, anti-criminal uh, uh, organization and the similar uh, area of freedom, security and justice. Well, uh, uh, Russia is frequently is associated to our common and joint activities in fighting criminality and in fighting terrorism, which is quite obvious because they are so close to us that in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, joint police teams uh, working together in the same area, it happens that they are part sometimes of our own activities. And despite the fact that, say, we have uh, even closer neighbors, uh, such as the Western Balkans, which are, I hope, and I work for, will uh, enter as soon as possible into the European Union. And these countries, mostly their students, uh, their businessmen, have the problem of visa and the cumbersome procedure they are subject to to get visa and to enter into the European Union. Even more cumbersome after security became such a paramount issue for all of us. Well, uh, one of their main requests has been we want a visa facilitation program for us for the Western Balkans, for the specific reasons of our being so close to you. Well, the first visa facilitation program was adopted for the Russians. And uh, uh, after that program was adopted two years ago, similar programs uh, along the same patterns were adopted for uh, each of the uh, Western Balkan countries. So you understand under how many uh, angles uh, this kind of cooperation is going on. Of course, there are also other areas uh, 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 where uh, cooperation goes on, areas where we are not uh, 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 European Union only, we are NATO, and therefore with the US. Think of Afghanistan. But this goes to my second point, but in any event, it is quite clear that our uh, uh, let's say, uh, military resources and others wouldn't easily reach Afghanistan without the cooperation of the, of the Russian. 
And that's it. I mean, uh, this is something that has been going on, it has continued. At the same time, at the same time, we have adopted decisions or events have occurred due to which the relationship with them has uh, turned out as very uh, difficult, sometimes harsh. Georgia is one of the cases. Who started that kind of business uh, is something that should be inquired about, but in any event uh, it happened in, in August. But we don't have uh, only that, let's say we have the fact that uh, throughout the years we have continued a policy due to which enlargement of the European Union and enlargement of NATO have proceeded jointly with, uns with one specific element that uh, NATO has always arrived first also for practical reasons, <laughs> because joining NATO is not so <coughs> difficult as joining uh, <coughs> the European Union. The, uh, let's say, preconditions for joining the European Union are much more cumbersome. 80,000 pages of uh, acquis communitaire is something that takes time to be digested for any country. And NATO, despite its being military, is much simpler somehow. And this is perhaps the reason why, generally, uh, the new member states of the European Union firstly joined NATO and secondly uh, the European Union. The fact of the matter is that the same kind of sequence has been adopted also for other very delicate countries, Ukraine and Georgia. And this is something that has been resented. The previous uh, uh, US administration decided that in order to defend ourselves from Iran and other uh, rogue or at least dangerous uh, states, uh, we needed a, a platform of ballistic missiles and the platform was, the decision was that the platform should be based in Poland, which of course for the Russians was not so nice. They thought that Iran was closer to other regions more than to Poland. They said it, but the decision, uh, as far as the previous administration was concerned, remained. And this was not helpful. Uh, what happened that, uh, and this is something that has to be noticed, uh, the European Union went on in its cooperative activities almost ignoring this other side uh, 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 of the same coin. And that's why uh, I think that the definition of schizophrenic approach is technically correct. And if you look at the, not last, but the meeting between the two parties in October, when Georgia was still there, a very hot issue, and the missile business was another very hot issue, the meeting uh, between the Russians and the Europeans went on easily and completely ignoring this. Oh, well, no, I'm now, uh, uh, one minute, that's too much. Almost completely ignoring. President Sarkozy said uh, that the other party was listening with great attention to our positions. Uh, and uh, both parties agreed on a conference on security to be held uh, next summer. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is that this was a sort of addendum, because the sense of a business as usual somehow prevailed in that meeting, and it was noticed. 
uh, if, if you read the excellent comment that a very good uh, re uh, British researchers, Katinka Babish wrote for the uh, uh, Center of European Reform of Charles Grant in London, uh, she describes this meeting in November, not in October, I was wrong in referring to, to, to October, as something somehow difficult to understand. Uh, why, why we, she said, are discussing with them, almost ignoring. Uh, schizophrenic attitude which eventual, eventually does not pay. Because when uh, we had in December, January, the usual uh, Ukraine uh, uh, tragedy or comedy, or comedy and tragedy, both of things, I mean, anybody could understand that there was something behind it, that if a problem existed, uh, it did not really uh, refer to uh, natural gas and uh, its price only. There was a deep political tension, and therefore the occasion for this tension to come out was given, as usual, by this kind of uh, issue. Uh, cutting uh, the <coughs> flow of natural gas and therefore involving also uh, European Union countries, etc. In other words, the case of Ukraine demonstrates that we cannot go on uh, along two parallel tracks, ignoring the one when working on the other. And this makes a lot of sense. I mean, because we cannot easily, continuously, and in good faith, with the necessary mutual trust, cooperate with somebody if there are so relevant reasons of confrontations with this somebody that no agreement is possible on very delicate matters. And we have to come to terms with this <coughs> divided reality and find a way to uh, create a sort of common framework in which all of these issues find uh, an acceptable solution. Which, <coughs> of course, might occur only if uh, this, all of the items that go to security find an acceptable solution for both. A very high official of the European Union in a meeting, in a conference that uh, I, I took part in a, a few weeks ago in Barcelona, said that we have to find a place where the Russians feel comfortable uh, in relation to security. And of course, we ourselves have to feel comfortable, not the Russians only. This is quite obvious. So we have to face this kind of uh, remarkable issue. And in order to do it, we have to decide two things. What do we want with Russia? And when we say, what do we want, who are we? Who are we, in my view, are Europeans and Americans for the very simple reason that the strategic interests involved in the relationship with Russia are exactly the same. That there is no difference at all. We have nuclear proliferation, we have terrorism, we have energy security, we have climate change, we have drug trafficking and other criminal activities. I may add, because it's more European than American, stability in the neighboring countries, which is 
actually a common interest that we share with the Russians, despite uh, what both of us are doing with Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, largely, I would say that these two can be considered an American interest, even though not so directly as it is for the European, for the simple reason that we are there and you are here. But that's the only difference in, in terms of distance, not, not, uh, not in terms uh, of, uh, of quality. Now, uh, being it so, on the assumption that uh, the Americans and the Europeans have the same basic interests vis-à-vis -vis the Russians, and the Russians have our own interests in, in the world. This is another important point, because if we rationally reflect on their role in the world, we understand that in terms of anti-terrorism, anti-criminality, energy security, climate change, and nuclear proliferation, they themselves share our own interests. So here we have a set of interests in relation to which we have the Europeans and the US on the same side, both of them interested in finding the right connection with the Russians because also the Russians may stand on the same side. Why does it come that we uh, uh, are, uh, well, we can easily find an agreement, Americans and Europeans, it's not so easy with the Russians. And again, and, and, and here is what do we want with Russia is, is, is the relevant question. Why am I saying so? Uh, I want to be very candid. When uh, Georgia uh, came out as an issue, there were reactions both in the States and in Europe as if communism had happily returned in Russia. And therefore, we could happily resume our previous positions without uh, 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 any more sophisticated kind of analysis. We have our traditional enemy there. We can restore the traditional conflict between us and them. We are here, they are there. Which is partially true, not in the sense that communism has returned in Russia, because frankly speaking, this has not happened. But because inside that country, there are those who see the relationship with us in the same kind of adversary scheme that was typical of their previous regime, nationalists, militarists, and others. But Russia is not monolithic. There are other positions inside that country. And therefore, we have to be aware of this very obvious truth that whatever we do, we have an impact inside the country. And that impact might lead to, uh, let's say, give a, a sort of uh, internal uh, success to one of the two sides or to the other. And this is something that I have personally tested. I've talked to some old, old friends that I had in the liberal wing, is, if we may call it this way, of Moscow. And one of them told me a few days ago, I fought communists for my entire life. I cannot find myself uh, as if I were one of them. You cannot consider me as if I'm not. So what can we do? What can we do? Let us think for a moment to the developments that have occurred, let's say, after the end of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, Russia as it was at the times of Yeltsin, Russia as it was in the initial years of Putin, Russia as it is now. Well, I say something that all of you are well aware of. 
Russia is a very proud country. It has always been such so. And therefore, the humiliation that they had to suffer immediately in the years that followed the end of communism was a sort of deep injury for them. They were treated by us as a small country. All of us had in mind that their GDP had fallen to the level of a small of, of the smallest European member states. That their army had substantially faded away, and therefore, in terms of military strength, they were becoming irrelevant. They were indebted to death. I still remember the first meetings of the G7, which was at the time still G7, with the uh, uh, invited Russians, uh, not yet the eighth, but it was initially a, a G7 plus. When I took part in the meetings of the G7, mostly as Treasury Minister, even more than as Prime Minister, where the topic was uh, uh, the debt. How long could it take for them to repay? What were they doing to repay the debts, etc.? Well, it, the meeting was a sort of tribunal. We, the seven, the court, and the, def the Russian defendant there. And the minister, the finance minister, the governor of the uh, Russian Central Bank, uh, the couple of the uh, G7 meetings, and they were there explaining like students with, or like, like defendants what they were doing. And we on the other side <coughs> deciding whether this was enough or not. Now, I mean, it, it had to be so. It couldn't be anything else but this. But obviously, I can imagine their feelings while playing that role. Now, that time was over after a while, due mostly to their natural resources, more than to uh, their internal policies, I must say. Certainly, uh, they did not uh, comply with the manuals of the IMF to reduce internal debt. <laughs> but they were lucky enough as to have a, a, a wonderful market for their uh, 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 natural gas and, and other things. So they started buying assets in Western Europe at the time when our assets were increasing their values. Something before the last months that we have been living. <laughs> Anyhow, they restored somehow their position, or at least they felt that they were restoring their position, that they were reaching once more the standards of a country that is entitled to be uh, treated as a great power. But we did not treat them as a great power. We went on saying, well, this is a country with a small GDP, uh, and uh, uh, somehow we didn't take them really seriously. And, I mean, this has produced an effect in, uh, in, inside the country. Somebody uh, was uh, uh, writing, uh, let us ask, ask ourselves why Putin accepted in 2002 things that he's not ready to accept now, for this reason, for this reason. Because at the time he was still uh, under the rain. Now it's not raining anymore. And due to the fact that it is not raining anymore, we have to be very careful because a return 
of national pride and the reasons of, ra of national pride in Russia might also be a return of nationalist and aggressive feelings toward the other because they are there. Because Russia is a country where the army still play an important role in ideological terms, Russia is a country where Stalin is still very popular, like it or not. And, and, and therefore, and therefore uh, there is a tiger there. There isn't only a tiger, but there is a tiger there. And our conduct should take this kind of uh, uh, domestic ra range of domestic positions in very serious uh, uh, consideration. Of course, it is not easy for us just to ignore the fact that Russia besides these aggressive instincts that are still rooted in the country, also is not a nice democratic system. Human rights uh, are not a priority there. Journalism is a very risky kind of profession. And uh, sovereign democracy, as it's being called, means several things, where national sovereignty is still something aggressive toward the third countries on the one side, and where uh, authoritarian methods of governance still prevail over the rules that we considered appropriate for a liberal democracy. So we are well aware, we, and we have to be aware of, of these things. But again, what do we want from them? Do we think that a development is imaginable of the country toward the more democratic pattern? not necessarily leading to uh, our systems, which is not necessarily possible, but uh, going, let's say, taking more distance from the traditionally authoritarian methods of government that they uh, experienced in the past. It is not easy to transplant democratic rules in a country that never experienced them. Don't forget that there is an enormous difference between Russia and the other communist countries, because the other communist countries enjoyed communism for some decades after experiences the developments of governance of uh, all, all over Europe. Russia substantially was out of this process. And they passed from their czar to the communist regime in the early uh, 20th century without nothing in between, which is a problem anywhere in the world in terms of uh, 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 development of systems of governance. One of the problems of Iran is this one, after all, it, it, and it is substantially the same historical sequence, and it's not the only other case. So, democracy takes time. It, it, it took centuries in our countries to uh, get rooted, and therefore, I, I still remember, immediately after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall, I was talking to Russian friends, uh, and they said to me and to others, uh, be patient, because it will take many, many, many years. Several of us are convinced that we have to create a democratic system in Russia, but we are equally convinced that it will take uh, years and years and years. And they have not arrived as yet. So, to make it short, we have to find a way to, uh, let's say, organize 
our positions. And my simple, and I make it simpler perhaps than it is, but my simple suggestion is we cannot expect them to proceed along the route of better and more acceptable rules in terms of human rights and democracy unless they feel safer in relation to their security. Because if they don't feel safer in relation to their security, the anti-democratic forces that exist in the country will prevail. We need a, a sort of uh, steady, safe, uh, and uh, not uh, considered by them dangerous kind of climate to exercise successfully the influence that we have to exercise upon them to change also their domestic patterns. Therefore, security remains the main issue. Therefore, starting with human rights doesn't lead anywhere. And we know that it doesn't lead anywhere. Whenever we start with human rights, after all, Putin, who is a clever man, reacts by uh, uh, opposing uh, the double standards that we are using. He did it the other week with Barroso. Barroso tried, and, and he said, well, and what are you doing? Is Western Europe the golden uh, 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 framework of democracy and human rights? Are immigrants coming from our countries better off than they are in Russia? Uh, are you treating everybody according to, etc., etc.? And it's easy to demonstrate that not to speak of Guantanamo, etc., etc. So there are always reasons for them. We might say, well, but there is a difference. Uh, 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 our uh, uh, mispractices uh, in terms of human rights are clear exceptions to a system that on the whole work. In, in your case, uh, it's not the exception, it's a rule somehow. Yeah, I mean... But it's, uh, I repeat, it's not easy. So security. Security means several things, which are, in my view, easier than they seemed months ago. I remember months ago it was impossible to tackle these issues with them because there was the missile issue. And actually, with Medvedev, had counter-proposed their missiles in Kaliningrad. Uh, I was telling Rita Hauser yesterday evening that my... Mm, yes, I was telling you that, that what I had in mind that... But, I mean, sometimes things are simpler than they seem. A telephone call might be enough. Not by the president that had initially decided about the missile platform, but by a new president. Well, the new president uh, uh, made the telephone call, and uh, this changed the picture in relation to the missiles. Uh, he was also clever enough to underline, talking to his counterpart, we both are in our 40s. We have nothing to do with the Cold War. We were kids during the Cold War. So why should we, uh, 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 let's say, fight with each other using missiles? And the other one accepted the new uh, playground immediately. And therefore, now we understand that that platform that clearly was, let's say, opposing the reasons of geography, to say the least, uh, won't be uh, uh, deployed there. And as a consequence, Kaliningrad won't have Russian missiles. There isn't even the space in Kaliningrad for because either there are people in Kaliningrad or missiles. It's so small. So it was another crazy idea, anyhow. So, 
two crazy ideas have neutralized each other and have disappeared happily. First step, successful and encouraging. They start understanding each other. Well, the second step, in my view, has to do with NATO. Has to do with NATO. Are we really sure that in these new cases that we are facing, we can continue with the sequence NATO first, European Union enlargement second? Does it really make sense? If somebody tells me, but this is what we did with the initial uh, uh, acceding states, I respond, but this happened when Russia was a sort of minor Luxembourg in our view. Uh, now uh, we might dislike the idea, but we cannot ignore somehow their reasons. And their reasons, frankly speaking, in, uh, with, let's say, things as they are now, we should candidly respond to the question, would we be ready to accept at our borders a military alliance we are not part of? We would not. We would not. And if somebody uh, counter-argues, ah, but this means that you want your neighboring countries to be your sphere of influence, we would say, no, this has nothing to do with the sphere of influence. It has to do with the fact that they would be under the influence of a military alliance I am not a member of. And therefore, I prefer a different setting at my borders. I might be wrong, but I find this a reasonable argument, an acceptable argument. And therefore, my suggestion is, and I'm not alone, the first ones to advance this proposal were the British, who tend to be very pragmatically oriented in their positions months ago. They were the first ones to say, let us stop it a little bit, which does not mean never. It does not mean never. But we could reverse the sequence. We could somehow give an acceleration to the re economic and other relationships between Ukraine and uh, uh, the Union, between Georgia and the Union, and leave uh, NATO somehow aside for a while, which does, uh, I said, which does not mean that it's uh, something that we have to forget about, because for the future, the security issue will be solved if we sort of revisit Helsinki, and here I enter into the typical jargon of diplomats, uh, we think not of a Helsinki too, but of a Helsinki plus, they say. What does it mean? I didn't know what it meant. But it seems that it's so clear. <laughs> Helsinki too uh, uh, seems to mean that we might change everything. A, a new security setting in which NATO could also disappear, be dismantled, and we invent something else. Uh, I agree with those who say this is a little bit too much. I mean, we have to have understanding, but before throwing an organization that has an aki, that has traditions, uh, that uh, has uh, somehow uh, means, rules, patterns uh, uh, of conducts, common training, etc. This was perhaps be a sort of a crazy decision. But quite clearly, the original idea of Helsinki, NATO plus a partnership of Russia, has not worked. 
we have to reinvent this kind of linkage. This is what we have to do. We have to reinvent this. And reinventing this implies an idea certainly different from the one that initially Medvedev had in mind when he proposed a conference on security for the next summer, namely the idea of a Euro-Russia security leaving the American somewhere else. This was already at the time unacceptable for us, but perhaps it's meaningless for him now. And the uh, future frame is a frame where this security is, uh, uh, includes Europe, the US, and Russia. If the fact that we share in the world the same interests is a fact, and it is such, as I said. Of course, having the US and Europe means having the two components that are trained on the basis of common policies and common values. The added element could be more easily inserted precisely for this reason, precisely for this reason. But we have to aim at a, a, a security system for us and for the world including the three of us, which of course have, has a, a, a lot of uh, useful byproducts. It uh, somehow precludes for the future uh, uh, Eastern alliances that perhaps nobody wants, but could become unavoidable for them should the relationship with us be somehow interrupted. I think of China and Russia. China and Russia don't like each other. But in the latest years, they have been working together. Military exercises together. Because if, uh, if the West is the enemy, at that point, the others join with each other. And this is something against our interests, and we have to avoid it. Somebody has also envisaged a possible alliance of oil and natural gas producers. And uh, uh, along these lines, Russian, Russia would be with Iran, and not with us, limiting and curbing the dangerous, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, factors that all of us understand uh, exist in Iran. So, I mean, it would be a formidable kind of conclusion, not easy, but uh, in my view, this is what we should aim at. At that point, uh, making uh, the European cooperation uh, let's say, uh, less uh, contra uh, contradictory, less inconsistent with uh, the security matters, and also giving us the necessary uh, authority to influence their domestic process. Uh, we are uh, uh, somehow the... Uh, uh, copyright holders uh, of uh, democratic institutions uh, and uh, it's not easy for them to accept from us the license. And therefore, if there is confidence, this kind of process becomes perhaps feasible or at least easier than it is nowadays. Building confidence on the basis of this confidence uh, uh, somehow uh, give more force to our action for uh, better democratic patterns and uh, higher protection of human rights in Russia. But confidence comes from security. And in security, there are things that we have to change. And this is what I wanted to tell you.
thank you very much for those very insightful remarks. Uh, we have time for a few questions. I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. Sir? Wait, wait, wait a second. She gives you a microphone. Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think of Russia's relationship with the Ukraine? I worry about that all the time. I've got a feeling that they would like to uh, have more influence in, in uh, the Ukraine than they have now. What do you think? Well, I think that we ourselves want to have more influence in Ukraine, and the only solution is to have it stable. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, there are interactions between uh, different aspects. If they understand that uh, we are not pushing for Ukraine in, in NATO, they might take it easier. At that point, this might make it easier for us to uh, foster our uh, economic and commercial relations with the same country and to uh, slowly lead it toward accession to the European Union. So it's this kind of interaction I rely upon. It might work, it might not work. Sir? At the moment, I, uh, I would consider it a sort of nonsense, going beyond the scope. I mean, because it's something that uh, is uh, against reality, I think that restoring a sensible and working partnership between them and NATO is already a formidable outcome. I would pursue that for the future I, I don't know, but at the moment, uh, I wouldn't set the target, uh, I mean, so high. I, I, think it's, uh, it, 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 I think it is too high. Well, also President Obama likes resetting things. He uses the same expression. <laughs> so if both of them reset, it will be a wonderful computer eventually. <laughs> I mean, re resetting may mean several things. May mean several things. It may mean cooperating instead of, basically, basically. I, I can't forget that uh, years ago Putin spoke of a Western vocation of Russia. And I liked that expression uh, deeply because Russia is in between. Eh? It's uh, in part Europe, in part Asia. It will always remain such necessarily, but uh, attracting Russia toward the West and toward Europe is something that I consider beneficial to them and beneficial to the world. Not because I want to be clear, I like the idea of the West versus the rest. It's an idea that I hate because it leads to hatred and therefore I don't like it. But I mean, uh, 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 strengthening cultural links also is extremely important because this is something that can be done. So let him reset. You know, I, I just want to interject that uh, on a visit to NATO headquarters many years ago, we asked the same question that Stephen Schlesinger just asked you about uh, to the uh, Polish uh, representative to NATO. What about having Russia Russian. join uh, NATO? And the gentleman responded, Russia join NATO? Russia is an Asiatic power. Yeah, but this is something that is being said also for the Ukraine. Eh? They have this problem, and for the Turks. 
you mentioned that uh, years ago, um, when Russia uh, started to take part in the G7 meetings, it was uh, economically not seen as, as really, really uh, being a part of that. And then, obviously, uh, uh, with the increase in the price of oil and natural resources, uh, the country became very important. Now we have a uh, meltdown of the financial markets, yeah. and, and also significantly in Russia, but also natural resources. What effect is that going to have on the pride of Russia that you mentioned before? Well, you know, well, uh, yeah, some of them are being humiliated. Huh? Western bankers uh, well know about the queues of Russians trying to sell desperately their titles in the uh, last weeks uh, because they have been losing. They have been losing enormously, I would say. In my view, this is not uh, this is not bad. This is not bad because. Uh, their uh, richness had nothing to do with the wealth of the country. These were groups uh, extremely rich, too much, I would say. The way they are spending money in our countries is incredible, really incredible. Golden furniture, for instance. Of course, there are Italian uh, small firms happy to <laughs> produce beautiful chairs with golden pieces here and there. I remained horrified when I saw the 